the yeah, in fact, on the on the least side of the mountain, the dew point all the way down will be the same. Yeah. Okay. So I, it's entirely possible that in the next few days, our computer staff will figure out why it isn't running correctly, but odds are not. So just let's go ahead and plan. You're just going to print it out on paper, and I will grade what you print out. Yeah. Uh, you said that um, our AD and everything will be up on top, so you can check our work online. But yep. What work are we going to have online? Well, no, what it means is when, when I, when you have this printed out, and at the top of the page, oh, you can't see wrong point here. At the top of the page it says this. I have another program where I can type that in, and it will give me the correct answers. Not that it's all that hard. Okay. It's just I don't want to do it 47 okay. times. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? And that way, we just can't make the two programs connect like they're supposed to for some reason. It's not installing it correctly. There's a bug or something. So I'll have to just grade them by hand, but at least if I have your net ID and your, uh, and your last name, it will generate the same puzzle, the same problem you just did. Okay? All right, so it's not really that big of a deal, uh, but uh, it will be part of your homework problem. And uh, yeah, anyway, okay. We have moved on now into the severe weather unit of the course, which is actually quite related to the stuff that was in the mountain problem. In this unit of the course, we're going to be talking about tornadoes and thunderstorms and hail and lightning and hurricanes and so on. And all of these, of course, are examples of rising motion in the atmosphere. Now, when we have rising motion in the atmosphere, we know that that is going to be producing clouds and, and, and updrafts and storms and all that kind of good stuff. Today's lecture is about a property of the atmosphere called stability that is all about whether or not rising motion will happen. When we did the mountain problem up here, it wasn't really very hard to picture why rising motion should be happening. I mean the air can't go through the mountain, right? It had to go up over the mountain. When we were talking about fronts, it wasn't very hard to picture why rising motion was happening. I mean, there was no place for that warm air to go, but up when that cold front was coming through, pushing it out. But lots of severe weather happens when there's nothing like a front or anything like that around, or there's only a weak front, or maybe there's only small hills. Clearly, there has to be some way to get air to rise that isn't about the mountain or fronts or whatever. Clearly, we have to have some property of the atmosphere that's going to determine whether air rises on its own. And that property is going to be stability. To get information about the stability of the atmosphere, we have to gather observations of what the air temperature and winds and so on are doing aloft. At the surface, we have information from like weather stations. You can go out to the, to the airport and they can tell you where the weather station is, or you can go out to the National Weather Service office in Valley, Nebraska, and they can show you, and it's just a cluster of instruments on a, on a piece of equipment that measures temperature and dew point and so on. A loss is a whole other story. And part of what we're going to be doing in this unit of the course is spending some time talking about the equipment we use to measure what's going on aloft. And the first piece of equipment, if you will, that I want to talk about is something called a pie ball. Pie balls are, pie ball itself, that word, is an abbreviation or a contraction or whatever of the word pilot balloon. And a pie ball is a very, very cheap way to measure the winds aloft. This fall, back in November, I had the privilege of getting to go to a hot air balloon launch. There was, there was like the Omaha Hot Air Balloon Club, and they invited the atmospheric science department to go out there and watch them, sadly, not to ride the balloon, but whatever. And shortly before they take off, the pilot says, pie ball, and he releases a helium balloon up into the air. And everybody stands there and watches it. And what they're actually trying to figure out is what the winds are doing. They're watching the balloon as it rises, so that they, when they take off, they're not suddenly surprised, whoa, what's going on over here? Right? The little helium balloon shows them, oh, I see the wind turns this way, and at this level it gets much stronger. They can watch the little balloon. And it's just a stupid toy balloon that they got at, like, you know, Toys R Us. Okay? Now, what we'll be doing is a little more technical than just sort of watching this balloon fly away. But that's actually pretty damn close to what a pie ball really is. Now, some measure of semesters ago, we got a chance to, or one of the courses took a field trip where we went to watch a pie ball launch. Uh, some of these pictures are awfully darn big. Let me see if I can get this a little better here. First, let's bust it out of blue line. Yes, yes. And there we go. Maybe we can even do this so it gets a little better. All right, so here we are filling the pie ball. 
It is a big balloon. It's being filled with helium. It's just a big balloon, though. That's all it is. Just like the toy balloon that the air, uh, hot air balloon pilot let go. It's just a balloon. That was a bit bigger of a balloon. And it'll fly a little faster and so on. And uh, we kept filling it up. This is just sort of some photos from that day. Here we go. Strange picture here. Uh, we, of course, had the problem with the first time that we filled it up, we didn't measure the door. Uh, <laughs> so somewhere along the way, we did this a second time. And what you do with a pie ball, I mean, it's just a balloon. So somebody stands out in the field with the balloon, and other people are standing there with this little telescope. You should be looking in totally the wrong direction. So the guy is standing over here, and the, the students are here with this thing that looks like a telescope. And it is sighted in on the balloon. And let me see if I got a better picture of that. So see how it's like a little telescope thing? It, this projection's not so hot, but it's a little telescope. And you keep the balloon in the sights. And so what's going to happen here is when we let go of the balloon, the balloon rises at a fairly constant rate. I don't know what the rate is. We, it depends on how full you make the balloon and so on. Let's say five meters per second. So once we let go of the balloon, we start tightening, and they keep the balloon in the sights of this field of light. That's what that telescope is called, field of light. Anyway, so you keep the balloon in the sights as it rises away. And the, the theodolite is connected to a computer, the telescopy thing is connected to a computer that knows if I'm looking in this direction and the balloon's been flying for 10 seconds, that means the balloon is here. It can figure out exactly what the coordinates of the balloon are, right? It knows how long it's flown, so it knows how high it is, and it knows it's looking this high above the horizon, this far off of north, or whatever. It's just geometry at that point. So it does all of this math, and from it, it figures out where the balloon is in every possible second. And then, well, if it got from here to here in, this many, in that second, it must, the wind must be going this fast. This is a pretty damn low-tech solution. So the kids went out there, and we launched this theodolite, and um, the balloon starts floating away, and people are tracking it. And so here are some students with sighting it in, while other students are just sort of gawking and pointing or doing nothing. And they watch it drift away. And it actually gets quickly very hard to figure out where the hell the balloon is. Because, you know, like it goes behind a cloud or something. Right? But this is a pretty cheap and easy way to get observations of the winds of luck. I mean, it's just a balloon. <laughs> and hooked up to this piece of equipment that's down there on the ground. But I mean, frankly, the balloon, does, do we recover the balloon when it, when it pops? No, it just falls and pollutes the world. So this is a fairly simple thing. On the other hand, the only information that we have gotten from this balloon is the winds. I mean, all we've been able to do, I mean, this doesn't have any way of figuring out the temperature. It doesn't have a thermometer on board. It doesn't have a barometer. It doesn't have something to measure humidity. All it is is the balloon. This is cheap. We can do this as much as we want. Now, in the United States, we don't launch just tons of pilot balloons or pie balls because we have other ways of observing the atmosphere a lot, too, but it, that are just more expensive. We're going to, when we talk about weather balloons, which have an instrument package hanging from them called a radioson, I'll bring one in on the next time we meet. And the trouble is, a radioson costs like 500 bucks, and we don't get it back, and it falls to the ground and smash. Okay, so we can't afford to do that. We can afford to do it because we live in the United States, but poor countries can't. So this is, tends to be how like Africa meteorology gets done, is with eyeballs, because it's cheap. They can do this, right? Unless, of course, it's cloudy, in which case you lose track of the balloon pretty fast, or it's, say, night, okay, where you can't watch the balloon. I mean, there are lots of problems with trying to do this. By the way, actually, it's, it's true. Uh, I, as most, most of you know, I am, by training, an African meteorologist. Um, the way they actually do it in Africa at night is they hang, they don't use high, they don't use helium. Helium is expensive. They use hydrogen, and uh, to fill the balloons, which is sadly explosive, which makes it really troublesome. That at night, the way they do it is they hang a long rope from the pie ball and they hang a candle from it, a real candle. <laughs> anyway, that's going to be dangerous. I've never been anywhere near it. They've done that, but that scares the crap out of me to think that they would. So one way that we're going to get information about the atmosphere loss would be with that pie ball. And in practice, by the way, when we do something more complicated, like when I talk next time about weather balloons, which have this expense instead of packages below it, actually, we do it very similarly. We actually have a little GPS system on board each of those radio songs, those packages of balloons. Uh, all it does is it says, I'm at this location now. Two seconds later, I'm over here. So the wind speed must be whatever to get me from here to here. But it's basically the same principle. It just doesn't involve actually watching the balloon and float away through clouds and so on.